All right. Now I'd like to welcome to the show, uh, personal finance guru and YouTube content creator, Spencer Johnson. Welcome to Free the Economy, Spencer. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. All right. So we've talked about YouTube before here on our show. For example, we've had Javier Hernandez, who's communications public affairs manager at YouTube itself. He was our guest in episode six, and we had a great conversation with him. And and I'm very interested, as anyone who has talked to me for five minutes can tell you, with possibilities that plat the platform offers, YouTube offers, not just for, of course, fun, personal expression, but for career development, making money, learning about money. So can you tell us how you ended up in this space on on YouTube, talking about money, talking about personal finance, and how your face ended up on our computer screens every week? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So my, my journey has been a little bit interesting, I guess. I actually... So I went to the University of Texas and I studied civil engineering um, there. So obviously not the personal finance or finance at all, what I talk about today. Um, but about my junior year or so of school, I kind of figured out that I really had a passion for the, for the personal finance stuff, uh, specifically like credit cards and traveling for free and just building smart financial habits in general. So what I ended up doing was just starting the channel just for fun and hopes that maybe one day it would do something. And it was a way for me to scratch that itch while, you know, still studying civil engineering. I also added a business minor to try to scratch that itch, but that's not obviously the same as a full major. And then I guess after I graduated, I had worked in engineering for one company for about a year during school. And I worked for them for about six months after, but the channel kind of started to gain enough traction for me to be like, well, there's a real opportunity here for me to maybe take this full time. And considering I didn't have many responsibilities at the time being a you know new grad and really only having myself to take care of, I was like, well, I'm going to take the chance on it. And that's where we're at today. I'm still doing it full time for about eight months or so now. And it's been a good ride. All right. That's exciting. Now, uh, now a platform like YouTube has the capacity to make people money, of course, if you're a content creator. But of course, most, most people aren't going to do that. Um, but it also has the opportunity for people to learn a lot about money, about making, saving, investing, all that kind of stuff that kind of they apply in their daily life. Mm -hmm. How do you look at uh, YouTube as a sort of financial literacy tool? Uh, you know, does it does it go, do a good job of teaching people the stuff they like didn't actually learn in school? I personally think so. I think that's where I've gained, you know, 90 percent of my financial personal finance education um, is from YouTube. And, you know, of course, you're not going to be sitting there with a financial advisor on YouTube necessarily, although there are, you know, either ex financial advisors or what have you that do make YouTube videos. That's not me, obviously. I'm not making that type of video. Uh, no financial advice here. But still, I think that the basics of personal finance are definitely very well understood in the YouTube space. And of course, I've learned mainly from YouTube, but also from books. And I think that that transition from like, you know, books and I guess classic education to, like YouTube and the digital education is something that's just going to keep happening over time. And the fact that you can get it all for free on YouTube is, is pretty awesome in my opinion. Yeah. And it's interesting that you have YouTube is this big open platform that, uh, you know, doesn't cost anything to access and, you know, doesn't really have any barriers to, to people joining uh, besides just their, their time to make content. But, you know, one of the concerns I've heard from a lot of people over the years with educational and factual content on YouTube is the same that people have had for years about Wikipedia, which is, you know, there's no gatekeeping content control on the front end. So it's theoretically possible that people who don't really know what they're talking about, you know, can get right. on the, you know, get on the platform, give people inaccurate information, stuff like that. Yet, despite that, despite that the, the this lack of editorial control, both platforms are, uh, you know, YouTube and Wikipedia are extremely popular. They are full of great information, and we know they're full of great information because millions of people keep returning to them every day. So what, what if anything, does that tell you about, you know, open platforms, user-generated content, how people make and share information? Yeah, I think it's mainly the fact that you're almost having that editorial being done by the audience in a way. Like the only way that somebody becomes successful on these platforms is if they're saying something that is helping somebody out, especially with the finance side of things where it's like, I mean, if you give somebody bad advice, the comments are going to be riddled with basically tearing this advice down. And that's kind of like that, I guess, kind of keeping itself up in a way and having that editorial take place there rather than by, you know, like a governing body. But at the same time, you definitely can get bad eggs in there where you might have folks that are just they are just there for the money and they'll post whatever they can to make money. 
And I still think that you can kind of sniff those out. And over time that always, you know, that always does happen. But for the most part, the people that are giving, you know, good advice, good information just to the public are going to be rewarded in the sense of having more social proof with a bigger audience. And I think that that's kind of like how you can keep those checks and balances in place, at least in a way. It's interesting because that, uh, you know, the other thing, especially when it comes to things like, you know, finance, even if it's, you know, household finance, uh, not necessarily sort of like a big bank financial corporation strategy is that people say, uh, well, you know, why should we, why should, why should we listen to this guy? You know, uh, he doesn't have a PhD in finance or whatever, you know, you know, he seems nice and he has a cute dog, but you know, Mm -hmm. how do we, you know, how do we know he's any good? Um, and that, that seems to be the obvious answer to that is that over time, the proof is in the pudding and that the people who have subscribed to you and watched you in the past, uh, subscribed to you and, uh, you know, watched your channel in the past will be coming back and that growing, that growing support, which of course then feeds into the algorithm, how often your videos are served up to people. Exactly. Um, sort of, uh, shows that, but it's also kind of interesting to me that the, this space has enough room for people of all different kinds and backgrounds. Like you said, there's people who do like finance and investing professionally full time that are also on YouTube. Like, I don't know if you mm-hmm. guys know this guy, Patrick Boyle, who's, he started his own investment company. He's a professor of finance. Uh, he's, he's also, he's, he's written textbooks. He's has all the like formal qualifications, but he's also on finance making some kind of funny, wacky videos sometimes about Sam Bankman fried um, yeah. and, you know, whatever topics are in the news. Um, so you have people who are sort of recent graduates. They're kind of, you know, turning, turning their side hustle into a job, uh, into a career and vocation. And then they're relatively at the beginning of their career. But then you have people who are really are big late career professionals who um, they're still on the platform too. And they obviously get some value from it. Yeah. I think what I was going to say too, is that my, my whole approach to YouTube has been, I just want to document my experience through this part of personal finance that I'm going through. And I think that's what helps people really relate to me specifically. Like you might see the audience demographics being different from somebody like Patrick Boyle to somebody like myself. So for me, that's one way that I've kind of basically made it to where there's no way that I can give you, I'm not giving you advice on what you need to do. I would never put out a video saying you need to get this credit card. You need to invest in this. Like, that's not the kind of stuff that I do. It's more like, this is what's working for me. This is my experience with this specific thing. And there's no way that you can really tear that down. And I think that's kind of also like the whole, if y'all are familiar with like Alex Hormozzi, that's kind of his whole approach to his content is like, I need to do the thing first and then I can talk about it online. And that's kind of how I go about it as well. Of course, I can sit there and do the research and give you some some good answers that you might not have found yourself since this is my job. But at the same time, I don't think anything kind of beats that hands-on experience, which is what I try to provide to my audience. And that's why I think even like the, like my, my target audience is generally in like that 18 to 35 range. And so, you know, basically people around my age. And I think the reason for that is because I'm just sharing my experience and a lot of people have that same experience as me at that stage of their lives, you know? Well, yeah. And I know, so we're talking about some of, some of these other YouTubers, people who are on who have their own followings too. And, you know, I've certainly noticed the videos about personal finance and credit cards, if anything, have become even more, even more popular in recent years. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I probably subscribe to, you know, a dozen people channels that I'm sure people you've known, people you've interviewed, you know, people you've met in person, uh, who are uh, mm-hmm. these other, you know, credit card, personal finance people. Uh, but, you know, I think from one perspective, people would say, well, that almost seems like like a threat as a content creator. If you're in this really crowded field and there's so many other people, um, does that. And of course, there's new people kind of, you know, joining the the game all the time. You mm-hmm. know, do you do you see that as like a competitive disadvantage or is it the level of enthusiasm for it is just creates more opportunities? Yeah, I'm definitely a proponent of like a rising tide lifts all boats. I don't think everybody's like that, even in our space, but I think. I'm lucky to be in a space where that seems to be the new, the new like ideology around, you know, collaborating with people. And that's something that I wanted to bring from the start of my channel, because I, I hadn't really seen many people in our space doing any kind of collaborations. Like it was all just, you know, we're all doing our own thing. And some people are kind of taking other ideas and trying to make it their own, but it's a lot of kind of copying out there. So I was like, well, the most beneficial thing to do here would be to connect with people that have, that are also, you know, having this shared experience of YouTube, but also this shared love for personal finance and credit cards. Um, So in my opinion, 
I think the collaboration actually is a very beneficial thing. I have, you know, I'm in a group message with probably 15 different credit card creators, which is a lot in and of itself, but we all have success in our own ways. And we all talk about our successes and help each other out. And I really love that. And like I said, not everybody has that same opinion, but I think that is the new way to be successful. And it should be the new way, in my opinion, because at the end of the day, we're all, we're all just trying to, you know, share our experiences and share our thoughts and share our passions. And if you are gatekeeping information, or you're just like, you know, not wanting to be very supportive of others, I don't think that's a smart way to be successful. But you know, maybe that's just my opinion. At least I got a few other guys with me that have the same opinion. <laughs> well, yeah, and it seems like, uh, especially in a space like this, where the the basic information is all is sort of public, right? Uh, right? Anyone can look up like what are the what are the credits you can get on the American Express Platinum card, or you know what are you know right. what are the what are what are the re- re- points earning categories on the Saver One card, or you know all those sort of things. And mm-hmm. so it's useful for viewers to have you go through it or to have another creator go through it and like tell you that stuff um but you can only create so much value by listing the same kind of like 10 facts right um so particularly in a in an area like this it seems like this sort of like collaborations and putting your heads together and like sharing strategy seems like um like the way to go yeah it just gives more life to the to the niche in general i think i think over time you know especially the credit cards it's been there's been like two or three people that have really, you know, paved the way for the last seven years or whatever that they've been doing it. And so of course you need some kind of switch up. And I know that they probably have gotten burnt out of doing the same thing. So I think bringing that new life to it is really good for not only the creators, but also for the audience who might be kind of tired of hearing the same thing. And to be able to bounce ideas off of each other is big. Like we have a lot of little like series that we'll do. Like somebody will make a video and be like, Hey, I basically I'll challenge the other credit card creators to do this. And we all make a video on it and it becomes a fun thing that we all get to talk about and the audience is on it. So that's my favorite part about YouTube so far is that collaboration. And I just hope that it continues and gets even better. You know, the one thing that actually interested me, which may be counterintuitive about all this finance content is how much it's not just about dollars and cents at the end of the day, but it ends up being a lot about a person's lifestyle and values mm-hmm. and even something pretty simple, like for, you know, credit card people will be familiar with this, the, the team travel, the team cash back distinction with credit cards. So two basic ways, you know, you can get, uh, you can have a credit card that gives you cash back. And so you get like two or 3% off. That's just sort of a discount. Um, mm-hmm. And other ones that allow you to accumulate points with hotels or airlines. And then you can use those usually to do uh, travel. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, one of the questions when people say like, oh, well, I want to get more out of my credit cards. What should I do? And this is like often one of the basic questions are like, well, you're more interested in cashback or, or travel rewards. Um, so but when it comes to like making that even that decision, you kind of need to consider about well, like, what's a person's age? What's their relationship and family status? How often do they travel? What are their plans for the future? Even really long term things like what are your retirement goals? Right. All of those things are are actually very personal. Right. And it's not it's not just about a do- uh, like a a number on a spreadsheet. It's about sort of like maximizing your lifestyle. And one, you know, another one of these creators that's pretty popular that's sort of like a little a little to the side of what we're talking about, but I think it's sort of related is a guy named Caleb Hammer. And mm-hmm. he helps people manage their household expenses. And he does these YouTube interviews where he, often with people who are in debt. And he tries to kind of kind of work with them about trying to figure out how to be smarter with money. But those conversations, which are, you know, again, I find kind of like fascinating and addictive because they they almost turn into interventions where he's almost sort of right. like their personal counselor. Because when it comes to why people are spending money in a certain way or why they're not managing their finances better, it has a lot to do with stuff that's like personal and emotional with them. That's less about right. money than it is about value. So I I, I wonder what how how you have thought about that, where like it's again, it's easy to put things in a in a spreadsheet. And I, you know, I, I'm my laptop at home. I have a spreadsheet that you have made <laughs> that I saved and um, you find nice. useful for doing things. But, uh, but ultimately the reason why people are doing all this isn't so they can have the perfect spreadsheet. It's so they could have like a better life. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's a big thing that I try to preach on my channel because there are still people that they are very tied to the numbers. And, you know, going back to this specific example of the team travel versus cash back or like how you use your credit card points. There's a big movement out there that's that's always been there with the credit cards of like aspirational travel redemptions for your points. So it's like you're going to go to the Maldives or Bora Bora and you're going to get 
you know, use your points to give you 10 cents per point when in cashback form, you're only getting one cent per point. And some people are like, that's the only way you should be redeeming your points. And in my opinion, a big thing I've been trying to say is like, in general, the vast majority of credit card users should just be using their points to better their life in some way. Like it should just help you to offset some of your travel costs and you don't need to be so stressed about, you know, getting the maximum value. And that's a very niche example of what you're talking about. But I do think that lifestyles play a massive role in this. And it's really fun to be able to like dive into, you know, which credit cards are right for this specific type of person, um, stuff like that. And I like connecting with people on that personal level. So, you know, through my DMS or what have you, but, it is, it is a very personal game, you know, the credit card game. And that's what I think makes it so engaging for me and something where I can talk about it on a daily basis because every single person I talk to has different needs. And it's, it's hard to make videos that are just like, you can try to make videos that are, you know, this is the best credit card for you. But in reality, that's ne it's never true because you, you have to be keeping people's like personal needs in mind. And that's, that's what I try to, to show on my channel because just like Caleb does, I would love to be able to sit with every one of my subscribers and be like, this is the exact right credit card for you. And that is something I've considered starting to do a little bit. It's like bringing people on and if they're comfortable and talking about that. Um, but I think that's the beauty of it. I think Caleb's done an awesome job. He's also an, an Austin guy. So, and that's where I'm from as well. So maybe one day I'll get to meet him here, mm -hmm. but I think you see a lot of newer creators that are trying to really bring in that personal aspect. And that is, I think what's going to separate us not only in the niches that we're in currently, but as time goes on, when it comes to, you know, AI and all that kind of stuff, that's a whole different conversation. But in the sense that you want to make your stuff as uniquely you as possible, I think that's the only way to do it is through that personal connection with people. Yeah. And, I, and so I want to like hop back to one, one thing you said about the difference between your channel and some other channels that you're not uh, offering financial advice. You're more just sort of t telling people about your own sort of credit card journey and experiences using these like products. Um, that is, that is something that crops up a lot. That phrase, uh, this is not financial advice. Yeah. People say that for a very important reason, right? Mm -hmm. Because while YouTube may not have a lot of restrictions about what content you can post in general, the world of financial regulation <laughs> does have yeah. a lot of rules that people, certainly practitioners who are in the world, in the financial world uh, have to follow. Uh, you know, maybe you haven't heard, you know, maybe not all of our listeners have heard of the investment advisors act of 1940, but it's, it's, it's a big law. And, yeah. uh, so that you know regulates people who provide investment advice, and it regulates what it what that definition means, what right. what that is said constitutes financial advice and what doesn't, and provides for some significant punishments for people who don't break the, who break the rules. So mm -hmm. the you know like we said, the videos on your channel aren't really the kind of advice that's regulated under that particular law, but mm -hmm. there are plenty of finance channels out there run by some young content creators who do get advice on stocks, cryptocurrencies, options, okay. derivatives, all, all this other stuff uh, that very much is covered by that law. Mm -hmm. And uh, personally, as you might uh, have intuited from my tone of voice, I'm uh, I think I think some of them are being a little bit rec reckless when it comes to um, those rules that I think they imagine that people at like JP Morgan have to follow, but maybe they don't have to just because they're they're on YouTube. Do do you ever think about that, or your is your credit card stuff kind of outside of that, so you don't really worry about it? Or do you do you think about that, like the legal and regulatory stuff? Uh, uh, does that have an effect on like what content you decide to make or decide to like forego? I think it does go back to that conversation that I was just having about the sense that I am not the person that's going to say this is the one credit card that is best for you. My goal is to give you options based on my research, and if you go look at you know some of the titles are like the best travel credit cards or whatever, but that is a way for you to go into that video and see 10 different options and pick which one is best for you. That's that's one thing on the regulatory side, of course, that I just don't want to deal with, but it's also just a personal value. I don't want you to go get a card that you actually don't need and then come back and be mad at me or at yourself for paying the super high annual fee. So I try to, I try to give very balanced reviews on everything. And that's in a sense because of this regulation stuff, but also just because I think that's the most beneficial thing for the audience member. Um, but I do definitely see on the, especially on the, like the crypto and the investment and vice side of YouTube, I've always been concerned for those people too. And I think that you do see again, those, like those bad apples or whatever you want to call them, where they are pushing certain investments because of the money that's behind that, if they do that. And that is the place that I never wanted to be a big reason why I'd also didn't want to go down that 
necessarily like that general personal finance route, because that's where that line starts to get blurred a lot. And to me, it's just not worth that risk or, or just that, like, yeah, that, that moral, I guess, compass within me doesn't tell me I should be going to tell people what they should do with their money whenever I'm, you know, just trying to document my journey, you know, just going through it myself. Yeah. And I think that the, you know, the concern I have with some, again, some of these younger content creators that don't, if they've never worked for a financial institution or a bank, they just wouldn't know, right. I think, a lot about some of these like regulatory requirements, which is, you know, if you if you do, if you did have some experience working for an organization like that, you probably would have like some mandatory training, you know, as soon as you start your job and you would at least have some kind of background to know they're there. Some of these guys, mm -hmm. I think, probably don't even kind of understand that they're out there. And uh, I mean, even the it's just sort of like a like you said, there's sort of like a line and you it's not a hundred percent obvious when you get close to it about what constitutes, you know, quote financial advice under the law and what doesn't. But even when you're talking about like the uh someone wants a someone wants a, a credit card and they they say like, Oh, I really like the American Express Club Platinum card. And you would say, mm -hmm. Oh, well, the American Express Platinum card is a great card, but you can also get this co-branded version that is from Charles Schwab. Uh, okay. But of course, in order to get that one, you have to start a brokerage account with Charles Schwab. And so, right. and then, and, and and even just saying that, you're right on the edge of giving people's advice about securities investing. So, um, yeah. it's it's worth not you know not to like scare people away from engaging in this, but it is worth uh, thinking about because um, those sort of those rules are out there. But I think the the sort of like community of creators is kind of what makes this less scary, which is you've got a lot of people who have the same interests and have been doing the same stuff. That's where people can like share these ideas and, you know, uh, you know, warnings and concerns and stuff. And, and that, you know, for me, like I've always said the biggest and most important social media, social media network isn't Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. It's actually YouTube. Um, yeah, yeah. you know, cause uh, I think a lot of people, people, even people, even older than me, possibly, uh, they you know, they're not, if they aren't really in the YouTube, uh, ecosystem, they don't watch a lot of stuff on there. They just see it as, uh, well, this is a video hosting site where mm -hmm. like where videos go and you can watch them on the internet, uh, which, which is true. The YouTube does do that, but, yeah. um, I don't think they necessarily appreciate the social aspect of it, which is feedback, comments, subscribers, you know, community, the community, the community tab, mm -hmm. um, you know, so for you, you've got, you know, you've got the people you know personally, you've got people you're in a group chat with, you've got people on Discord, mm -hmm. um, but you also have the social aspects of the platform itself. Mm -hmm. How big a, how big is that for you, meeting and connecting with people, as opposed to just, this is where people get to watch my videos? Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's really everything to me. That's the biggest the biggest point of YouTube, in my opinion, is to have that community. You know, even if I, like, I don't have aspirations of having millions of subscribers. That's not what my goal is. Cause in my opinion, you could have a million, millions of subscribers and have no relation to your community at all. That's kind of what you see on all the short form platforms. Like, I mean, you can see, and also just as an example of short form creators that come to YouTube, you'll see all the time where they'll have a million plus YouTube subscribers, but they're getting less than 10,000 views on their videos. And that's because there's just no real sense of community there. And so for me, it's like community comes first. I I'm like super active in my community feed because I want to just connect with people on a personal level, like, you know, three times a week is what I'm doing right now. And then two videos a week. So like there's a touch point every day of me interacting with my community. And I think that without that, it's going to be very hard to find success. And I, depending on how you define success, but for me, I think the success lies in a smaller tight knit audience than a massive just audience that does not really care about you as a person, but just cares about the information you're giving. And that's what I've always said with my channels. I'm not, the goal is not to necessarily be the one that gives you hundred percent of the information all the time, never gets anything wrong. And is just listing facts because that, I think that's easily replicable. But for me, it's what can I tell you about me and my journey? And have you just kind of buy in that with me and just go along it with me with whatever part of the journey you're at. And that execute. Well, yeah, I guess the that's an important point where the the point is not necessarily to have the 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 hugest uh subscriber mm -hmm. numbers, uh, that there's a a quality um question there and uh, you know, a level of interaction that's important. So I guess you'd, you know. 
you don't want to be like the the Mr. Beast of credit cards. We are like we're yeah. we're shredding an American uh, American Express Centurion card here just for uh, just for kicks. Um, right. So there there's the uh, you know there's obviously the entertainment value of a mm -hmm. lot of like funny interesting uh, YouTube videos. Again, like the sort of like Mr. Beast type stuff. There's just the sort of informative side, which you know you got like professors who just put their classroom lectures on YouTube. You know that's actually mm -hmm. what Patrick Boyle started doing originally, um, or someone nice. like you know Os Oswasta Motoron from NYU Business School, things like that. Um, that's very academic, you know. But then you have again what a lot you know what we call it like the influencer space. You know, some people don't necessarily like that term uh, or identify with it, but where there is a lot of factual content, but it's also some of its personality based, right? Right. Um, right. And and being being the kind of person who has this sort of you know who has this video series, who has this channel, who has the show, whatever you want to call it, your the you know you just you, your personality, your like how you come across on video, all that stuff that kind of does have something to do with it and that influences who people who people like to watch and who people want to watch maybe who they identify with who's maybe more like them or more their age or whatever do you know how does how do you think about that in terms of uh you got to be you know you got to be you got to be on you got to have the right personality not just like the right information is that like an anxiety thing do you do you try to optimize that yeah it's a good question i, I think for me, I am the kind of person that uh, in all of my videos, I just want to come off as exactly as I am in person because that reduces all the friction in filming. That reduces all the friction in communicating with people in the real world if I meet them, you know, stuff like that. So for me, it's literally like I want you to feel like you are sitting with a friend in the room who is telling you about this stuff, not being preached to, not being you know, told this is exactly what you need to do because I know more than you. It's more of a position of like, you know, I want to learn about this with you and I will tell you exactly what I found but in a sense that it should resonate with you because this is how I personally feel about it at my stage in my life. And hopefully that's valuable to you. And so, yeah, I think the entertainment piece is big though, because like we were talking about earlier, if it's just, if you're just providing information, you could find that online. So that's, you know, you're not going to find like a big audience that way. And from the beginning of my channel, I wanted to kind of do it as a personal brand. And that's why my channel is my name. And I try to, you know, bring people into different parts of my life. I don't just talk about credit cards. Like I, do Q and A's all the time and try to try to engage with the audience in that way. And I think that's a reason that I, my audience and me feel so connected in a sense and compared to even, you know, maybe other channels of the same size that, that maybe just don't do that as much and in other spaces specifically. And I also wanted to come back to a sense too, of the more quality, I guess audience, you can call it over the quantity is something that I can kind of say from a privileged standpoint, because finance pays so much better on YouTube than any other niche. Like Mr. Beast's numbers are, if he had that in personal finance, he'd be making like 10 times more probably at least. So it's like, there is that, that aspect too, where I have that luxury of being able to, to, uh, be happier with a smaller audience. Um, but I did want to note that in case, you know, people were curious why I was so like nonchalant about that. Cause I don't really have that big of a channel and I'm doing this full time and that confuses people a lot. But in reality, there's a lot of monetization opportunities for a finance channel that might not be present for entertainment. Well, that is a good point. And, and the other thing I think about people with, you know, who are starting out and they're building that small to medium sized channel. And uh, they're thinking about like, what's my, what's my break even point? At what point can I quit my job or what in the, in yeah. the future, if I were going to do this, where, you know, where would I have to get to? And one of the things that I've heard from a lot of creators and people on uh, who have like, especially left a sort of nine to five and be like, I'm an online content creator guy is, you know, like multiple income streams uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, like different ways to, to, to monetize what you're doing. So uh, obviously, you know, on, on YouTube, you get, you know, uh, paid per, you know, thousand views. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the, probably the most obvious one uh, that people think of in terms of being like an online content creator, but you know, people have all sorts of other stuff um, where they do uh, you know, like if you wanted to do like, you know, one-on-one -on -one coaching and consulting mm -hmm. with people, people be like, Oh, well, you know, what's, you know, what's the best, you know, cards for my small business or, or whatever you could like set aside a time and be like, okay, well here's 60 minutes and I'll charge you X number of dollars. And like, we'll do, we'll walk through this one-on-one. -on -one. Um, right. And then going out and do, you know, doing events or writing a book or, you know, like there's all these other sort of things that you can sort of bolt on 
mm-hmm. that you could make money from with the same focus. So exactly. I wonder if uh, have you have you thought about you know are you going to be like the king of multimedia in the credit card world of like branching into like other stuff for you know uh, giving those you know promotional uh, those you know enthusiastic you know sales seminars at the Holiday yeah. Inn by the airport. Um, where where else does this go? Yeah, I personally, my whole, I guess I can give you like a quick kind of income breakdown percentage wise, at least is, you know, most people, like you said, think of that, that Google AdSense that, that YouTube pays you. I Technically, I guess it's per view, but we see the, the values based on per thousand views. Um, and that is actually probably the smallest or it's, yeah, it's probably the smallest percentage of my income, um, you know, for for our space, especially, I think the big three are going to be that AdSense. And then you have affiliate, you know, partnership opportunities with, with different credit card links and stuff like that, which that has a lot of compliance and a lot of that regulation behind it. So I do get some of that in that sense. And that's a big part of my income and then sponsorships, of course. Um, and sponsorships are usually at least the biggest for a small to medium sized channel, I would say, because you can leverage that, that audience a bit, um, better than you can just by, you know, view wise. But of course, views views is what it all comes back to. If you don't get views, you're not going to get sponsors or you're not going to get card signups or anything like that. So that's kind of how my my revenue has been broken down. I did recently uh, announce that I I will take uh, consulting calls like that, if you want to call them consulting calls or coaching, um, where I will help people with that. And in reality, that's not something that I even really want to do as like, that's not what I want to be at all. It's more of like a, hey, this tool is there for people that might be interested but I'm not pushing it as like, you need to do this right now. Again, it's the whole thing going back to my philosophy of like, none of this is really a mandatory. It's like, I just want to help you through your journeys. And this is one aspect that I can do that in. I think the the focus for my stuff going forward is always going to be around the content. I think YouTube's going to be even bigger, obviously, in five years than it is today. And it's going to include many more opportunities. So I think for me, it's maybe expanding a little bit into other parts of the social world of say more short form stuff, more live stream focused stuff. I have the podcast and the normal like long form videos, and those are kind of like my bread and butter. But I think over time, you kind of develop into having more of a entire like media, uh, like empire in a sense. If you see other, you know, the massive channels are on every single thing. So that's kind of where I see it going in the force, like the near future. As for where it goes after this, I think there is room for certain things like like courses in a sense of like, here's a like credit card kind of mastery course of how you can go from never having a credit card to having whatever credit card you want and traveling for free. I think that could be cool. But I think honestly, it's going to be like a kind of just flexing with the with the platform and seeing where it goes, because I couldn't tell you where the platform will even be in a year from now, you know? All right. Uh, well, all of it is very exciting. And uh, yeah, Spencer, this has been a great conversation. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, it'll be all the more exciting when I watch your next video on YouTube to know that we've been here uh, yeah. talking one-on-one about it. So uh, before we go, uh, uh, just remind us where we where we find all your stuff online. Yeah. So on YouTube, it's just my name, Spencer Johnson. Technically, I guess at Spencer Johnson Official, if you're putting the channel uh, tag. And that's that is my tag on every other social media platform is at Spencer Johnson Official. So you can find me there. All right. So no, no impersonators allowed. Spencer Johnson no. official only. <laughs> yeah. I even paid for the meta verified, even though I have no, <laughs> no followers on Instagram. So, you know, it's me. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks for being with us, Spencer. No problem. Thanks for having me.